meeting, uh, which I guess is a good introduction to here we go again. Uh, in some ways, it was as, as uh, challenging as it was, it was easier last fall because all the rules were in place that we had to follow and we had no choice. Uh, this year, uh, SUNY is into local control as much as possible and is leaving it up to each individual institution uh, to make most of the determinations regarding how we're going to operate for this uh, for this fall semester. As you know, we plan to be uh, 60 40 for this term, 40% online and 60% on campus. Uh, I, we thought that was a little conservative. Turns out we were prescient, and that was a good thing to do. Uh, we were always planning on uh, masking in the classrooms and gathering places. Now we we'll be Right now, anyway, we're masking everywhere in county buildings as we are this evening. So we, we didn't have to change. We didn't have to change that one. Some places we're going to ask only the unvaccinated to be masked, but that's very hard to track right now in this environment. Uh, unvaccinated will have to be tested every week. Uh, well, not, that is a requirement to be tested every week if you are unvaccinated. Uh, students will be required, will be given 35 days once a, a vaccine has achieved standard authorization uh, versus the emergency authorization vaccines have now. Students will be given 35 days uh, to get vaccinated with that regularly authorized vaccine or they won't be allowed on student campuses. Uh, that's one of the hard rules that will go into place once we have a vaccine that has standard authorization. Most, uh, most of the rest is up to us and they have given us guidance, not, uh, not requirements. Uh, one of the things they've recommended, which we're doing is that we require resident students to show proof of vaccination and we are doing that. Another thing that they have recommended uh, is that we require athletes, those playing on our, our athletic teams to show proof of vaccination. We are doing that. I believe every SUNY institution is in both, in both cases because students have choice there. Uh, they, they don't have to live on campus. They don't have to play a sport, but we can't stop them from getting a, a higher education. Uh, well, even if they don't decide not to get vaccinated, they can study online. If, if, if at, a, at the wrong time in the semester, they can find the classes. So if someone just simply does not, will not get vaccinated, it's best they sign up for all online classes. So they aren't asked to leave campus at some point when we have a regularly authorized uh, vaccine. We know that 56% of our uh, faculty and staff are vaccinated, or well, we know for sure that 56% of our faculty and staff are vaccinated. I'd hope by now it would be higher than that. Uh, now, also recall those 40% you know, classes that are uh, online, many of our faculty will be teaching from home. They won't be regularly on campus. And if you're not coming to campus, then you're not required to, we're not expecting you to be vaccinated if you, if you don't wish to be. Uh, but in, after all, we are a higher education institution and we believe in science and social science. And the science and social science is overwhelming uh, in favor of overwhelming beyond overwhelming in, in favor of getting the vaccine. So uh, we hope that everyone involved in our industry on, on principle that we support science and social science as a major principles of what we do would, would, would get vaccinated. Uh, while right now we're required to wear masks uh, in all county buildings, the SUNY doctors from upstate and downstate uh, have said it's safe enough for vaccinated faculty to teach when very hard to lecture for hours on end with a mask on. Uh, that it's okay for faculty as long as they keep their six foot distance or more to lecture without a mask. We'll have to see the uh, with the county restrictions whether that's even allowable. But the doctors say because they, there's also you know, to lecture for hours on end with a mask on has its own, uh, its own uh, potential potential impact, uh, including on the. The teaching and learning that's that's going on, and people being able to understand what's being said. So that's another another hurdle we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to get over. I think I've covered all the high points for um, 
for the uh, for COVID at this point. We will test everyone in the first week of school. Uh, SUNY recommends that we test everyone to get a baseline. And then after that, if you are not vaccinated, the requirement is to be tested once a week. So we'll be back to doing what we were what we were doing last semester. Thank. Uh, after that, I think I've covered all the, the high points for for COVID for the fall. The biggest pushback we're getting now, of course, is stressing students to please get vaccinated. Some just it's dramatic, and some just don't want to do it. And uh, they they couldn't get an interrupted education if, if we all of a sudden get a. Uh, timing who knows how bad the timing is going to be from standard authorization comes from one of the vaccines but we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it uh, enrollment's doing a little better than projected it's, it's it's good news it's still not great but it's better than projected at the moment and so we're we're just a little better than the uh than the targeted targeted budget so that, that's good news at least for this week we'll see how it goes this week and next I hope that that holds up we've been around the same number for a while, it dipped down a little bit the last few weeks, but now it's, it's dipped back up. Uh, we're very happy uh, about that. Uh, Anthony, uh, Barbara, and myself met with the county leadership uh, recently, uh, given the, the budget situation and enrollment, the county was asking uh, appropriately so, what's our sustainability plan for the future? Michael, we'll go over that with you here this evening. You have the uh, uh, an outline of the sustainability plan, uh, sustainability plan right in front of you that we've uh, that we've shared with the county. Uh, we've got uh, thanks to uh, generosity of the last two administrations in the Congress. Uh, all of higher education, you know, had some some pretty healthy uh, some pretty healthy stimulus, and community colleges fared fared quite well in that process. Uh, so we've got a couple of years to figure out what we're going to be in a couple of years given the, the demographic challenges in this region and across the country, uh, we can't rely on the, uh, and nor can any community college really in the nation, although it helps if you have a growing demographic in the South or the West, um, the level of uh, tuition and, uh, and tuition-based subsidy that we have in the past. So uh, we've got to figure out over the next year or so, and then begin to implement things uh, next week to help us be uh, leaner and meaner and to attract more of a shrinking pool of traditional students and a challenging pool of adult students because the job market is so hot, people can work if they want to work. You all probably know that over the generations, community colleges enrollment, as it did during the Great Recession, tends to spike upward uh, during recessions and tends to go down during uh, hot uh, economic times like we're like we're in right now and, and of course that's happening uh, all across the country and it's kind of the reverse for senior institutions they tend to do uh, better in good times uh, when mom and dad's uh, savings portfolio is, is doing better and uh, and not so uh, not so well in, uh, in, in bad times when mom and dad's investment portfolio isn't, isn't doing so well and it's just the reverse for, for community colleges so we've got challenges on, on both fronts and, and we've got to figure out strategically how we're going to do business differently when we get to the other end of the one-time uh, stimulus money, which we appreciate uh, we appreciate very much. We've got the team and the, and the folks to do it. We'll see whether the culture has the will to do it. That's part of our job and leadership to help get us to the will to do it, uh, to become a, a different community college in a, in a new post COVID um, ongoing birth dearth world. I encourage your sons and daughters to have more babies. That's the, that's the only real way out of this, but it will be 18 years um, before that helps community college. Uh, at this point, we've got a new dean who's joined us. I think most of you know Mike Kinney, who is always here with us, the maestro. Uh, so our new Dean of Liberal Arts and Business has, uh, has joined us. I'm gonna ask Penny uh, to introduce Jeffrey for us. Sure, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Anderson, uh, AVP and Dean of Business and Professional Studies and Liberal Arts. Jeffrey started with us on July 1st and has absolutely hit the ground running. Very busy time and has taken it over and 
taking it on. So looking forward to great things. So we'll be meeting all of the faculty, obviously, next week. And forward to that. Glad to be here to meet you all. Thank you. Welcome, Jeffrey. And that concludes our report, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Drum. Go back to item number one, approval of minutes. We have a motion to approve the June 17, 2021 Board of Trustees meeting minutes. So moved. Moved by Jim. Second, Second by Barb. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So carried. Item 2.0, the FNF meeting of August 17th. Kathy? Hi, good evening. Um, you have the uh, minutes before you, we had a good meeting. Um, all the recommended actions were approved, uh, were, are being recommended by FNF. And um, we also had a very good budget report. Michael went through a lot of detail with us um, around um, both all of the actions that are being taken um, by the um, college uh, senior team around um, enrollment and increasing enrollment across multiple programs at the college, and then also walking us through um, the rolling, I'm going to call it a rolling forecast, because that's how it, it makes most sense to me, but how the budget, um, the projected budget, and then where we think we'll end up over the next couple of years, and what kind of um, uh, state funding we need to have over the next uh, two to three years in order to get to a balanced budget. So I think uh, Michael will have more conversation about that today, but otherwise, um, I, we would submit the minutes um, as presented. Happy to take any questions. Any questions? Thank you. Item 3.0, uh, Kathy recommends that all the preferred agenda items be moved. So can I have a motion to move items 3.1 through 3.11? Tina, second by Jim. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? So carried. Action item 4.0, recommend approval to set the day and time of the annual meeting. We have that in the uh, September 16th. Right. And do we have uh, everybody at that meeting? I will. As far as I know. Okay. All right. Well, then I have a motion to move that. Barb, second by Tina. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So carried. Recommend approval of new IT 9002 web accessibility policy. I have a motion. Michael, second. I'll second. Jim, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So carried. Item 4.3, recommend approval of new AA4004 ethical recruitment of student policy. I have a motion, Michael. Second, Barb, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? So carried. Going back to item 5.0 in the information note, Dr. Ross, can you give us an update on the student affairs? Um, within your report, you'll find information about the diversity of the community from a full-time employee perspective and student perspective. The data that I received comes from HR and institutional research, uh, respectively. IR generally takes a snapshot and does longitudinal information um, with regards to students and highlights their first time, highlights our first time, full-time um, enrollment with the students. This is important because when you understand the trends and where efforts should be made to improve student success, it's critical for the sustainability of, of our college. On average, we do a pretty good job of retaining our students from fall to spring. Our, our cohort is a little over 75% uh, retained. Asians obviously, well, I'm not gonna say obviously, I'm sorry about that. Asians do fare the best um, with black students not Black students doing the worst on average for first time, full time students um, uh, going from fall to spring. But, and, but when you look at the cohort, the average cohort of first time, full time students from fall to fall, it's a little more challenging because we're less than 50% um, at 46% for that average cohort. Asians are still retained at the highest rate. However, Black and Latinx students only persist at 36%. Um, Latinx students persist at 30%, and white students persist at 50%. So 
So within the report, you'll see the trend data over the past 10 years for first-time, full-time students. But we are making great strides in trying to increase the retention rates and help students persist not only from term to term, but to graduation. Um, addressing the variables that impact their smooth transition to the environment includes making sure that all students have the requisite paperwork done because that's the, one of the biggest challenges um, to getting them in the door. They've been advised, they, we work with to make sure that they're registered, have books on the first day of class. Um, the other day I met with a group of ELP students and I asked them to share their concerns with me about attending room and the EOP students generally reflect um, their, their low income students of color. Um, some of them come from, from rural areas, um, but they, they're in a program that is designed to intentionally and strategically put forth efforts to make sure that they, they succeed. And one of the biggest, probably of the the trending topics that, that they have are, are making sure that students are afraid to fail. And I know all students are afraid to fail, but this group of students is really, really um, afraid to fail. Surprisingly enough, only one student of that cohort mentioned money. And I liken it to the fact that with EOP, there are, um, you get quite a bit of grant money above and beyond what you receive um, by the fe from federal money and for, from state money, you get financial, good financial support from EOP. But also they're concerned about making the transition to the environment and, and, making, and, and making friends. And one of the things in my experience is that I found students of color that their social engagement, and I'm not talking about the partying and that sort of thing that comes later, um, but the social engagement is very, very important um, for students of color. So making sure that they feel comfortable in an environment, they um, know where they're going um, with regards to the facilities, um, they are at ease um, you know, with their peers as they settle in is very, very important. It's also very important for students of color to be in an environment that is reflective of who they are. And, and one of the things I, I'm gonna make a concerted effort this year to also pay attention to is that the fact that diversity isn't always very visible. Um, even though we um, know that LGBTQI students, um, some of them are also at risk a lot of attention is not given to that cohort of students and that's something that we need to pay attention to, but it's, it's more difficult to see because it's something that is where a student has to self-identify. We don't do surveys um, to ask students if, um, if they're LGBTQI or not. You can generally tell um, a Black, Latinx, Asian, AAPI uh, student. So I think it's gonna be very, very important that you know, we, we work to pay attention to all of those cohorts of students. But in addition to um, trying to ensure that we retain our students, not only do we have the ELP program that does the intrusive intervention, we have the counseling program um, that does the emotional and mental support. But one of the things that I believe we need to, and we're working on as an institution, is making sure that our environment comes more closely to, um, for the students to matching the employees that we have here. And in spring of 20, our full-time um, uh, demographic profile of our employees was 2% Asian with 4% Asian students. Black students were at 2% with 11% Black, um, Black faculty and staff, 1% Latinx, 8% um, Black faculty and staff, 64% white students versus 93% um, white faculty and staff. 
And knowing that um, students of color are more comfortable in an environment that reflects who they are, um, efforts need to be made for us with us to enhance the employee demographic profile of, of the institution. And we know that minoritized employees often play a role beyond uh, their position description because we need for them to serve as mentors and on committees and be more visible because of the impact that they not only have on URM students, but on the community as a whole. One of the things that um, I'm doing with um, academic affairs is the Prodigy Program. Um, and the Prodigy Program is a SUNY initiative designed to enhance the number of um, faculty of color and women in STEM. We already have um, two Prodigy um, faculty. One, both of them are in STEM. One is a woman of color and, I, and her um, picture is, is in my, my report. But the other thing that we're doing is um, launching a faculty fellows program because it's so important to be able to create a pipeline. So we're going to reach out to BU will be our, the first institution that we reach out to for their URM graduate students to come and serve as adjunct faculty members to get exposure to teaching and, and serving in the community college, which we hope will increase our um, faculty applicant pool. The other thing um, that you will find in the report is where we recruit um, for faculty and staff and we'll work on, um, I'll work on this year trying to identify more strategic places to be able to outreach for, for faculty and staff. Um, one of the ways that the Division of Student Affairs has worked to try to ensure that there are um, more minorities on campus for students in the student affairs areas, we work with BU um, and have graduate students because there are quite a few URM graduate students in the um, student affairs program and in the counseling program. So they come and they assist our, our departments in working with our students. And the hope is that as we turn over those students, we already know how their work ethic and, and how they are, they understand the community college, they understand um, working with community college students. And we hope that through, through that relationship and, and hopefully we'll be able to expand we will increase our pool and thereby increasing the diversity in the community. And that is my important Thank you, Dr. Ross. Any questions for Dr. Ross? I have one question. On page 13, where you oh. said the EOP student stats from the fall of 2020 to the spring of 2021, um, it's really um, it mirrors the image from the 20 to 21. But I guess my one question to you is, from the average attempted credits to the average earned, it seems like in both semesters, they're dropping two out of four classes. What is that attributed to? This, for this past year, um, COVID and online took our students out, um, particularly the ELP students and, and quite a few of the URM students. Um, uh, Vanessa and Josh do yeoman's work in trying to intervene and keep them in. Um, but the online just made it much more difficult. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Dr. Ross? Can I also share? I'm sorry. Sure. That um, we have a Fulbright Scholar. You want to talk about it? Okay. <laughs> we have a Fulbright Scholar. Um, that is on campus for the next academic year. He's from Chile. Um, he just arrived Tuesday evening. Um, he is with us in partnership with Binghamton University. His specialty is human rights. And he will be teaching in the liberal arts department. So we're hoping to do some lunch and learns and some other kinds of um, engagements with him. Having a Fulbright um, in the community college is, is a big thing. 
So I'm really excited about it. And so hopefully um, you will get to meet soon. So Jesse will be writing something that will be yes, yes. fairly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, student assembly update, Mr. Woodward. Thank you. <clears throat> student assembly is very excited to welcome two graduate interns from Binghamton University this fall. One of the interns will be co-advising student assembly and will work closely with our student leaders. Our other interns will be co-advising co the activities committee with the SA vice president of, of student affairs, working closely with clubs on campus and will be focusing on student engagement. Uh, election updates, we have two students returning to student assembly, myself and, and another senator. Uh, we will start holding tabling events to recruit new students starting at the end of this month and next month. Thank you, Mike. Any questions for Michael? Hey, 5.4, BCC Foundation Report, Ms. Williams. Hi, my report is in the packet and I'll just uh, discuss a few highlights. Um, our fiscal year ended on June 30, 2021. And uh, we had a very good year despite a difficult pandemic. Primarily due to a robust financial um, market and the unrealized gains that we saw to our portfolio. Um, we have a record uh, total, total assets of $47.1 million, including beneficial interest and perpetual trust. And this compares to a year end June 30, 2020. Of assets of 38.8. So um, as of June 30, 2021, the foundation had a total net gain of $9,167,000, directly related to $7.67 million increase in unrealized gains on our endowment and a $1.2 million realized. Um, story behind that is that uh, at the realized gain, uh, that pretty much covered the majority of our scholarship bill for one year. So, free and clear money was a, a really amazing year for us. Um, we also uh, raised $400,000 more dollars in the previous fiscal year than we did the year prior, which uh, we did not anticipate. It's not skewed by any estate gifts. In fact, we did not have any estate gifts that settled in the past fiscal year. So that we got some larger gifts. And uh, while we have less donors, the average gift um, is higher. So I think uh, we were all fair and concerned we had and we prepared our budget. Uh, heading into the COVID pandemic, we had no idea that we would have such a successful year. I think primarily, um, nearly $180,000 of that money came in as a result of the Student Emergency Fund campaign that we ran. And one of the things we found is that people stepped up and were extremely generous to help assist our students facing financial emergencies and even um, help to pay the rent, the utility bill, things that normally we wouldn't be funding, but we were able to um, raise a, a significant amount of money, which qualified us for a match from the SUNY Impact Foundation, and we did award $183,000 in emergency funds last fall. We don't anticipate that we would be funding as many emergencies this coming year um, due to some of the stressors and focus some of those student rescue money that students were able to receive. So uh, I think overall financially for us, it really was a very good year. And we also funded a record number of scholarships and uh, support to the campus and the programs this past year. So all around just being really very fortunate. Uh, just a, another few highlights. We had a um, May series of virtual alumni uh, presentations where we conducted them through Zoom. And we connected with 
number of people, uh, and I'll tell you, it's equivalent to the number of people that we had at our last in-person alumni reunion that came on campus. We had four weeks of presentations, our faculty helped us out. We um, had a number of different you know, topics that we discussed, and I just found out today that as a result of one of those um, presentations that we did, we had a, uh, one of the first female engineers to enter the program here at Rome back in the day. She's 80 years old. Um, just uh, we had a connection with her as a result of that virtual alumni event that we held when it happened at Dr. Lofthouse, where Robert Lofthouse was um, uh, doing a presentation on STEM and engineering in particular, and she attended that event. And so um, she shared with us her path and her history, sent us a huge photo album of, of all kinds of wonderful things that we're looking forward to sharing during our 75th anniversary. But also that she informed us today that she has made a plan here in her will. And um, we had not really gotten, uh, didn't know that much about her, hadn't had she would make um, in annual gifts. But now we know her plan gift intention. And I think it's just an amazing uh, continued connection, regardless of the fact that this was a very dark year for a lot of people. So I call that just a number one success. Our staff is working with the uh, campus committee on the 75th anniversary. We are really excited about this. We're going to hang out in the coming year. So stay tuned for that. We are, have just finished our audit field work for a fiscal year 2021 audit. And um, another thing was we got a recent alumni stock gift closing out the fiscal year on the very last day uh, out of $100,000. And this stock gift was not um, given to us to develop the student scholarship, which most of our five and six figure gifts are to endow a scholarship. But it's to endow a fund which will help our faculty get training and development, faculty development and um, assistance to work with students who have special needs, but also will um, help support training for our students who are pursuing skilled um, work and careers where they would be working with students with special needs. And it's a significant gift from this family. It was a couple that met here, Mary had a child and um, decided that they wanted to get back. And uh, you know, they let us know that room changed their lives and they wanted to be part of helping to do that. So I think it's just a really nice story. And I did want to let you know that we are expecting an initial distribution of a seven-figure estate gift from an alumnus from the class of 1955. And we anticipate we're going to be getting the initial payment in the next month. Um, I'm sure you'll be hearing more about it and we talk about it at a number of times. And it was something that we've known about for a little while. But again, it was someone who um, did very well in their life. And Rome was a very big part of their life. And they made a significant investment. In our Any questions? Thank you, Kathy. Great job by you and your team. Thanks. Facilities update, Mr. Legakis. Anthony, you should have my report in your uh, packet. Um, Brief. Uh, right now, our focus is on preparing the campus uh, for, for the reopening for the start of the fall semester in a couple of weeks. Um, part of that, and Dr. Brown spoke the other day at the FF meeting, is we're finishing up the installation of the bipolar ionization units in all of our buildings, which will remove, will help remove contaminants from the air uh, to keep us uh, COVID safe. Um, we started work on the second uh, patio uh, adjacent to the library. Um, and we also anticipate, as you know, we've talked about this in the past, of constructing four uh, pavilions across campus. Concrete work for two of those will start on Monday. Uh, the concrete work for the other two will be part of the uh, campus paving project that, uh, that 
we recently received bids for. Uh, and you can see we've, we've got three major projects that will be ongoing shortly. That's the uh, replacement of the library roof and the penthouse renovation, uh, repaving a number of the campus parking lots, uh, including replacement and addition of sidewalk in critical areas on campus, uh, also handicapped accessibility improvements, and also the installation of pedestrian flashing beacons on our outer loop road at a number of locations to better warn and advise drivers that we have a lot of pedestrian crossing on that road because of parking. Uh, we also received bids to tint the windows in both the old science building and the student services building. Um, and we will be tinting smaller portions of other buildings as well in, in certain critical areas. Spoken to the fire damper access project. That project has been completed. Um, we're finally receiving the uh, standby generator tomorrow. Will be delivered to campus. Uh, that's been a long time coming, and that'll be uh, installed to support the IT server in the business building. Um, in addition to that, what I did not put on here because it took so long, uh, we did a project last fall to replace the uh, transformer at the AP building. That's finally arrived and was installed within the last uh, over the last month. Uh, and then I've listed a few projects that our SUNY room staff uh, has completed. Uh, we constructed two new uh, counseling offices in the, uh, in the old science building. We did uh, repair of uh, the floors and the benches and the, and the players' benches in the SUNY room life center. Uh, we also installed a hard floor in the uh, health services exam room, all done by our, by our staff. And lastly, we continue to evaluate the installation of fencing at, at certain locations across campus. And Dr. Drum and Michael and I identified another location uh, a couple of days ago. So that is my report. I would be more than happy to answer any questions. On the fencing issue, no, that plays a big role in how a campus looks when you start dividing it with fencing and also is prone to vandalism. Are you guys taking that into consideration? Um, I think what we can do, Anthony, I think we can hopefully prevent that by uh, by providing some type of landscaping in front of the fence to minimize that uh, so that it, it, it doesn't allow that to happen. You know, I'm not going to say it's not going to happen, but I think we can take some measures to. Uh, it just may be a significant maintenance item going forward. That's, and it doesn't buy us much, just a thought. Understood. Uh, uh, but but whatever the material is that we finally decide upon, we'll make sure that it's as low made as possible. And as I said, we'll try to structure it so that it minimizes any opportunities for said balance or anything else. Thank you. Any other questions? Great, thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, Michael five six five seven five eight. Our standard 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 information. Thank you. Five nine human resource update, Mr. Dorchin. Good evening. The personnel report reflects activity during the months of June and July. It was shared for informational purposes. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Thank you, Lynn. Budget and finance update, Mr. Sullivan. Um, thank you. So, um, in your packet is uh, the uh, monthly budget forecast through the end of July. Uh, which is 11 months of our 12 month fiscal year, which ends in about 10 days, um, August 31st. Uh, we significantly updated this uh, forecast to uh, reflect a balanced budget uh, with the caveat that we will utilize approximately $3 million of uh, uh, HERF to federal stimulus money uh based on uh stimulus money one of the major uh categories of eligibility is lost uh, revenue and um, uh, the variance uh, of revenue to budget was a negative variance of about five million dollars predominantly due to declining enrollment but also uh reductions um, uh, on the state uh, and county side so uh, based on that eligibility, um, uh, currently we're estimating that we'll need approximately $3 million of stimulus money to ensure a balanced budget for the current 
uh, fiscal year. I think the college uh, did very well in trying to reduce the costs to offset this $5 million negative variance to the budget. Um, approximately 2.8 million of cost reductions were done net of a 5% increase in the, in the health insurance premium uh, increase. Uh, so uh, uh, in effect, uh, needed a couple of million dollars to uh, to get to get the budget balanced. Uh, this number is pretty consistent to what we have in the budget that's starting in about ten days. A similar amount of about three million is what has been budgeted for federal stimulus money uh, for for next year's budget. So that's the update. So I can assure the board that we will have a balanced budget because even if some of these numbers uh, get a little bit worse, we have available stimulus money to offset any any further changes. Likewise, it might improve. Some of these numbers may improve slightly, which would result in needing less than the $3 million that we're forecasting. But I would say these are uh, reasonably strong numbers at this point in the in the fiscal year. Anybody have any any questions or comments related to that? Okay, so um, at um, uh, when the budget was approved uh, back in June, uh, the college. Uh, uh, decided to really needed to develop a multi-year uh, sustainability plan uh, in light of uh, two major factors, one being an ongoing uh, decline in, in enrollment uh, that's occurred at least here in Broome for the last four or five years, fairly modest. Uh, up through a couple percent a year, up through uh, 1819. And then with COVID, uh, as you can see in the monthly update, uh, you know, the college just this year compared to last year's actual down more than 16% in uh, uh, FTE, uh, student FTEs. Uh, so uh, between, um, kind of a steady decline in, in uh, enrollment, both in this region and New York State nationally for the most part, combined with the devastating impacts of COVID predominantly on the population that community colleges serve, as Dr. Drum alluded to, really needed to take a really, really hard look at how did, how did we need to position the college uh, prospectively given minimally those two major dynamics that aren't gonna go away soon. Uh, meanwhile, the college has uh, at least uh, uh, over the last several years has uh, done a multi-year forecast of, uh, uh, of both expense and revenue just to get a longer term view as to what kind of challenges or opportunities existed um, in, a, in what I would call a fairly short term horizon, three to five years. Uh, this is something that uh, middle states uh, acknowledged that we did and as part of their collegial advice uh, recommended, especially in light of COVID that the college continue to update that multi-year forecast on a regular basis. So in your next to you, uh, it's, it's electronic, but uh, also provided you a hard copy. There's a three page uh, uh, legal size document. And I'm not gonna go into a, a lot of detail because I think most of it uh, is self-explanatory. And I would like to acknowledge Dr. Haynes and her academic division, especially for the first page, which predominantly uh, the academic uh, division will, will drive and has driven. These aren't 
uh, many of which, as you review them, are not new to the college, but either are shifting its focus, expanding its focus, reinventing itself. Um, most of these you're very familiar with. The way this document is set up is there's basically two parts to, this, to the uh, sustainability plan initiative. The, th the first three columns on page one represent what we would call enrollment or revenue growth. This includes both new enrollment, new students, but more particularly retention of existing students, which um, there's a lot of opportunity to try to ensure that students who enroll in the fall continue in the spring or from year to year um, continue to uh, attend the college. So uh, the first three columns are primarily driving uh, enrollment and revenue. And um, we've, been, we've selected really the top 10 major initiatives. And um, this will highly be integrated with several other plans that the college regularly develops, inclusive of, of an IT plan, multi-year plan, a capital facilities multi-year plan, an academic master plan, a strategic plan, and a distance learning plan. And I'm sure there's others, uh, but those are at least a handful of critical ones that all interrelate with the financial sustainability plan. So first three columns really identifies key areas that the college is gonna focus significant amount of attention. We know many of these also are of great need by the community and given our community college, we certainly uh, pay a lot of attention in terms of uh, community need, especially in light of the fact that the state and county are supporting the community college. Um, so a ballpark estimate around uh, FTE growth is uh, approximately 225 FTEs, which is, uh, which is a, little, uh, a little less than 10%. And with every FTE being equal to about $11,000, that kind of gets us to a nice round number of about 2.5 million. Additionally, the last column on page one talks about college attempting to be, continue to be efficient. We've given you rankings in the past that shows us the college compared to its 29 other community college peers in New York State highly efficient in administrative costs and in other areas, is highly invested in both the instructional and academic support areas. So um, there's a number of initiatives here to continue uh, optimizing the course schedule, being more efficient around energy and continuing to take a very close look at any turnover that occurs and either contemplate restructuring or whether whether the position needs to be filled, especially in light of uh, declining uh, student enrollment, both physically and with FTEs and with uh, distance learning still being a major component of um, uh, instructional um, presentation. So um, that just gives you at a very high level, uh, both on the revenue side and on the expense side, um, uh, the major initiatives that we're continuing to pursue. Um, we have a number of uh, project management software that the college utilizes predominantly under institutional effectiveness, which also is reports to Dr. Haynes, and uh, uh, we're gonna try to integrate this information, each of these projects among many others. Uh, we have uh, annual goals and annual assessments that are done. There'll be a lot of metrics behind a, a lot of this, and 
we would anticipate that key leaders in the academic division will come before the board uh, with one or two maybe each meeting to just give you an update as to the progress that we're making and uh, uh, results that we're uh, see, seeing. Certainly on the cost reduction initiatives, I'll assume major responsibility to, to speak to that with monthly financial forecast among other, other documents. Uh, just uh, if you flip to page two, uh, one of the primary drivers in the revenue estimates, which are on page three, is um, high school graduation rates. Um, it's categorized here in three major cohorts, statewide, then kind of southern tier, counties uh, contiguous with room, and then we isolate room. Um, room is about, room county is about uh, 55, 56 percent of the students that attend room community college. So certainly that uh, there's a high uh, cause and effect probably high correlation as well between what those graduate numbers look like and what our enrollment numbers look like. So uh, SUNY provides this information across all, all 64 of its institutions, has it back uh, a long, long time. I've just provided uh, in this document, uh, just to give you some idea of kind of four years of actual history, uh, some of the dynamics we dealt with over the past four years. Uh, and then the middle, uh, the middle column is, is basically um, uh, the numbers that we're using to um, incorporate the financial projections. Most particularly, I draw your attention to the columns at the top that are labeled 20, 22, 23, 23, 24, and 24, 25. Uh, if you look at those three columns and look at the very last three rows, if you hone in on Broome, Broome County and look at the very last row, you'll see that what's projected after the current year's budget that's coming on board in 10 days, that after that, the following year, uh, it's projected that will have um, a 7.2% decline in 22-23. We'll have an uptick next year, next June, go up about 3%. Then the following year goes down 7%. So it's kind of the last big cliff that we're going to have to deal with in addition to the one we just dealt with. If you look at 2021, you'll see in that room uh, cohort at the bottom, 8.9%. So that's what we've been talking about is that 9% decline that we've been facing uh, uh, this year. So uh, unfortunately, two years from now, we have kind of a pretty close to a similar type of drop. In between those that year, we have a 3% projected growth in, in graduates. And then in 23-24, a 3% growth. So those two threes, three and a half, kind of mitigate the 7% drop. So, uh, but uh, when you go to the last page, um, what we're using as assumptions, you go to uh, the very first row that has assumption and comment narrative. Uh, you'll see that our net FTEs for the budget, uh, come, that the budget that's coming up in 10 days, we're proposing that we think that's going to be about a 16, per, 16 almost 17% decline. To drum indicated we're doing slightly better than budget and forecast, um, but that's the number we have factored in there. And then you'll see the next three numbers 1% growth. 7% decline, 2% growth, pretty comparable to the high school graduation rates that I just identified for Bloom County. Um, 
Uh, so uh, the way we just build this model, again, you can read the, the, the assumptions and comments for both the revenue side and the expense side. Um, again, uh, uh, we factored a tuition increase. We had no tuition increase or no student fee increases in the, for uh, the budget that is uh, coming in 10 days. Uh, predominantly because of COVID and the economic chaos to most of our students. But uh, prospectively, uh, we're utilizing uh, about a 3.85% uh, average based on that's been the average five years prior to the no increase this year. We're factoring that the state will continue to either provide a $50 increase if you're lucky enough to, that your FTEs grow or the current formula, which is 98% of your prior, prior year state aid amount, which is most likely the scenario that the college will experience. We're just estimating a 1% increase by the county, uh, uh, which again, prior to, prior to uh, this past year, uh, was the average for the last four or five years. Then on the expense side, uh, we're factoring a two and a half percent adjustment on the payroll side. Benefits are 47% of that number. Uh, just giving our aging infrastructure, we're, we're projecting a 5% increase per, per year for capital renovations and repairs in addition to the capital improvement plan that we submit to the county every year and a 2% increase annually for, for uh, the contractual category, which is everything other than payroll, supplies, travel, utilities, materials, everything else. So uh, if you then look at the second to the last row, uh, it says HERF 1, 2, and 3 funding. So, you go to the very first fiscal year, which was 219.20 actual. Uh, the college utilized for HERF 1, which was also called CARES Act, about 2.14 million. And that was primarily to offset the $2 million loss of uh, revenue against the budget, almost dollar for dollar. So we used federal stimulus money in last year's actual. As I mentioned in the monthly forecast, um, we're projecting needing about 3 million for the current fiscal year that ends August 31st. The board approved for the next column, 21-22 budget, the board approved utilizing, again, about 3 million of stimulus money for next year's budget. And then in the forecast, the forecast of three years, we're projecting in the first two years of the projection, fiscal year 22-23, about 2 million, and 23-24, about 2 million. And then that we'd be balanced uh, three years out. Um, just as a couple of other pieces of information, uh, if you add up uh, those uh, federal stimulus, amounts, it, uh, it totals approximately uh, $12 million. Uh, it, there are two categories of federal stimulus funds. One category is uh, stimulus money that goes directly to students. That was about $12 million for the three her funding streams. On the institutional side, which you can also use for students, but Predominantly, you're using it for the college, uh, both the college and its affiliates. Um, the total uh, amount that the college was received was 16.8 million. So when you add up uh, all the years that I just referred to, we're utilizing about 12.1 of the 16.8 million which leaves about 4.7 million. And that 4.7 million will either be used if we use more of the balance of 4.7 million if our estimates are off, um, and or 
there will be a need for the affiliates, housing and the faculty student association to cover uh, lost revenues within room and board, bookstore, uh, dining, uh, and uh, uh, childcare. So uh, as we conclude with their financial statements, which are June uh, 30 fiscal year, uh, there will be some need to provide some of the federal stimulus money to the affiliates for revenue that they lost, especially when the facilities were closed. Uh, but even uh, without them closed, uh, we're still experiencing uh, vacancies and uh, revenue uh, losses within those operations. So we will need to set aside uh, some funding for those purposes. In addition, SUNY has required all of its institutions to spend some of the stimulus money for certain initiatives that they've identified. So for example, under PERF 3, um, they've indicated that we have to use at least 5% of our stimulus money towards mental health services. Um, as just one example, uh, we're being required to provide testing on a weekly basis. That number will reach at least a half a million dollars based on $15 per test. So uh, there will be other uh, unanticipated expenses that are not in the budget that will be eligible under, under stimulus funding. Uh, so, uh, I just wanted to provide at a fairly high level uh, some assurances and some sense that the college is uh, attempting to prudently and strategically address uh, the financial dynamics that it's facing. And um, uh, we've generally articulated to this board that in uh, our recommendation to the board that the stimulus money, which again, one of its primary purposes was loss of revenue, that it buys us time over the next couple of years to transition all of the initiatives and more on page one to reposition the college to increase and stabilize its revenue side of the equation and continue our efforts as the college may get a little bit smaller each year to also ensure that we're being as efficient as possible uh, in terms of the cost side of the equation. And with that, I'll, I'll uh, respond to any questions or any comments that you have. Okay. Questions? <laughs> No questions. I just also want to give a shout out to four trustees who are involved in the sustainability plan here. Uh, Jason Andrews, who's a superintendent, he's working with the college on the fast forward uh, item number four, been integral in moving that forward. Uh, Trustee Connerton has been very integral in getting the hospitals on board to work with the college on item number six, which has to do with the health sciences. And uh, Trustee Fiala and Trustee Coffey, who were former county executive and former legislator, uh, both are involved with working with the county because the county support of the college is very integral and they're co-chairing a committee to work closer with the county. So I'd like to thank the four of you for your efforts at what you've done today and what you're going to continue to do going forward. Thank you. Um, five. Thank you. Anthony, just one other note on that. I think um, on a go forward basis, we discussed at FNF that Dr. Haynes would from time to time at our um, board of trustees meeting go over those initiatives, not all of them all the time, but on a um, sort of on a rolling um, go forward, we'll hear about them and particularly around best practices that are working or things that are not are not terribly effective and how we're going to change that up as it relates to enrollment. So I think it will give all of us a better understanding of 
what's happening in those major programs and certainly give us the ability to have talking points out in the community. Thank you. Uh, 5.11 candidates for professional recognition increment, Dr. Penny Deans. The report reflects the internet activity. Okay, thank you. 5.12 student housing report, Dr. Ross. It's a standard report. There are 82 monthly bond payments that have been made through August the 10th. The student village move in is August the 28th. Um, and we have some students that are currently residing in housing as part of the EOP program and our student athletes. Any questions for Dr. Ross? Thank you. 5.13 media report, Jesse. All oh, links are included in your file. Any other new business to come before the board? And a motion to adjourn. Yala. Second. Thank you. Everybody have a great week. Thank you. Oh, no. I figured out how to turn it on. What's going on?